Welcome to Multifamily Live. I'm Tim Yerusi. And I'm Jason Yerusi. Our mission is to help you unlock your full potential as a multifamily real estate investor. So you can do more deals, bigger deals, with less stress, keep more profit, and free up your time. Multifamily doesn't have to be a mystery. It's time to go live. Aloha, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I am, oh, I cannot, I can't even describe the excitement and the love and the just amazingness I feel right now for this guest that I am about to introduce to you. I met him on Clubhouse. He is affectionately known as Al- Uncle Alvin. Welcome to the show, Alvin Hope Johnson. Hey, Peely, how you doing? So good. Super happy to have you here. So everyone, Alvin Hope Johnson has been in the real estate industry for over 35 years, starting out as a handyman selling painting and repair services door to door. Alvin grew his entrepreneurial skills into an empire. He currently serves as the president of Hope Housing Foundation, an affordable housing company that afford, that offers beautiful, well-maintained, and safe properties. Alvin also serves as president of the Assertive Management Group, LLC, a privately owned company management firm that helps to support the foundation. He is also the president of Multifamily Monopoly, an educational platform for those looking to get into multifamily. Welcome to the show, Alvin. Wow, man, that dude sounds like he's pretty dope. He is dope, and I love him. So, Alvin, yes, man. Whew, there is so much, there's so much I want to ask you, but let's start out from the beginning. Your bio says you started out as a handyman selling painting, painting services, and repair services door to door. How did you come from that to where you are today? Wow. Um... You know, I remember even before that, Peely, I used to go to this. I was a teenager, had my first car, and I used to go to this warehouse where we would pick up pots and pans and all that stuff and load them in the car, and we had to buy it and then go resell it to make money. And I never made any money with that stuff. I mean, I lost money so much because people said they didn't have money, and I wouldn't press them for it, and they needed a pot, and I'd give it to them, and I'd wind up every day in the hole. So it's amazing that I went from that to selling um, door-to-door painting services. But the difference was when I was selling pots and pans, I was living with mom. And when I was selling door-to-door painting services, I had a family of my own at 19 years old. And um, the guy that I was, that trained me how to be a painter went out of business. And I got really good at it. I mean, I know I was good. And uh, so I would knock on doors and say, I'll paint your house for 200 bucks if you buy the paint. And, um, and I got quite a few jobs that way. And, um, the next guy, one of those guys I knocked on was doing a hotel job and that job landed me several million dollar project. And I was a millionaire by the time I was 20, let me see, 22, 23 years old. So, uh, we worked our tail off, but we had a lot of money in the bank for a minute, (laughs) for a minute. Oh, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to grab onto that word for a minute. So what happened? A fool and his money are quickly parted. So what does that mean? It means I made a lot of investments in the wrong people and the wrong things at the wrong time. Uh, This was like 1988, the interest rates were 17, 18, going to 22%. Uh, We couldn't find any construction jobs. And so the money just quickly went. I thought, you know, if I made it that quick, I'd always have it or I'd always be able to do it again. I never had anybody teach me financial literacy. I was 15 years old. My mom gave me her checkbook and said, Alvin, since you have a job, I'll give you, you know, we can bank, do joint banking together. It's like, great. I didn't know that just because the bank kept paying the checks that I had to put the money back. <laughs> I didn't know until my mama pulled me aside and told me, hey, man, you just cost me $500 in overdraft fees. And uh, so I quickly learned that. But but that's, that's it. You know, you give a 15-year-old checkbook, it's like giving an adult a car that they don't know how to drive or giving somebody a business that they have no business running. And so anyway, uh, I don't know. I want to actually go back. I want to latch on on what you said about wrong investments, wrong people, wrong time. I mean, this is, this is something we talk a lot about 
on Clubhouse, like finding and surrounding yourself by the right people. So talk to talk to us a little bit about how you invested incorrectly with the wrong investments, wrong people, wrong time, and how you're correcting that today. Okay. Well, let's start with the people. Um, you know, I was in my 20s, had a lot of friends, thought were friends, people that I grew up with. I wanted everybody to have jobs. I wanted everybody to have a lot of money. I wanted everybody to have the things that I had worked for and none of them were willing to do it, but I paid them like they were. Um, and again, you know, a fool's money goes quickly when you're doing that kind of stuff. Uh, investing in the wrong things. Uh, well, I had a paint contracting company uh, in the late eighties uh, when there were no construction jobs. There was no need for me to be buying company trucks and equipment and ladders and, and all that stuff, knowing that we, well, I didn't know, but that I couldn't get a job. So I didn't know anything about forecasting and data. And all I knew was I knocked on door and made a million dollars. I didn't know anything about anything else. So uh, that's investing in the wrong thing and at the wrong time. I love how you brought it back to simply knocking on people's doors and asking. And that's, I mean, we, we met each other on Clubhouse. So let's, let's dig into Clubhouse a little bit because that's still, that's still a hot topic with a lot of people. And that's how we met. And I swear my, I don't know if this happened to you, but my network blew open. I didn't even know you existed before Clubhouse. I know. And all of a sudden, like a few months in, I was talking to you every day. We were networking, we were there together. So now you're surrounding yourself with the right people. How are you able to attract that kind of energy? Oh, wow. I have no idea. You know, I've got 30 <laughs> something thousand followers on Clubhouse and I'm surprised that that many people want to hear me talk. But I, I, I'm, I'm just transparent. Uh, sometimes I'm a little rough around the edges because it is <laughs> the way it is. And I may not know how to sugarcoat it all the way, but um, I'm really short on excuses because I've got a lot of them that I could have chosen to use uh, to go be a mass murderer, a killer, a bank robber, or any of that stuff, or, or a nobody, or a homeless person. I have enough excuses in my tool belt to where I could be justified to be any one of those things, but neither one of those serves me well. So. Um, I tried to kill myself and that didn't work. So when I realized that I couldn't even kill myself and I wasn't good at that, I figured I may as well use that energy to try to go be great and try to help somebody else that may be in the same position I was in at that time and tell them that it's not worth it and that they can get beyond that. So I use a lot of my story for that. You mind if we dig into that a little bit? Because I think oh, there, right. some of my listeners might need to hear that because you never know you never know when there's that person that needs it, right? Because right. you could see that bright and smiling face and the next moment they're not here anymore. Right. So if I was someone that needed to hear your story, what would you tell me? Well, I would tell you, um, you know, I was a kid molested at nine years old. Uh, my dad left home when I was 11. So in an 11 year old's mind, he didn't leave my mom. He left me. He didn't want to have anything to do with me. Um, I got married at 17 because I was afraid to be alone because of the abandonment issues and because of the trauma from the molestation that I had suffered. And then by 22, I was a millionaire. Like, how does that happen? And then by 24, I was broke. On my son's third birthday with nothing to eat, literally that morning, we opened the cabinet. We had enough for a bowl of oatmeal. We were getting put out of our house that day. The lights were going to be cut off. And I thought it'd be better for me to not be here anymore because I had a pretty decent life insurance policy. And uh, so I put a 38 to my head, pulled the trigger a couple of times, a gun didn't go off. And then I took a bottle of nitroglycerin pills and said, this will definitely work because one of them blows your heart up. So two or 300 of them will definitely work. And then I said a prayer and I said, well, God, man, if you got a purpose for me, then maybe I'll wake up and just please forgive me. And if you don't, please have mercy on me because I heard it's a little hot hot down there but to wake up and go Alvin you couldn't even kill yourself you really are a loser that was the first thought I had when I woke up in intensive care after 10 days so to go from that to what 
ever people see me as today has only become, become because uh, the people I put myself around and the way I've trained my mindset and still do every day that uh, they can't eat me. I don't care what happens. They can't eat me. And so I may as well keep pushing. I'd be afraid to try that again now because uh, I'd probably go run across the freeway and get hit by a car and bounce off four or five 18 wheelers and live and be in worse condition than I was thinking that I didn't want to live anymore. So I can tell you suicide is the most selfish thing I've ever seen. And I can say that because one of my mentors that, that literally trained me uh, and gave me a chance in the apartment industry has 16,000 units. He died by suicide. And I saw what it did to the company. Um, a billion and a half dollar company went down the drain. Uh, his family was torn apart. Kids totally embarrassed and just really horrible situation. Uh, but out of that, um, you know, I, I, I often wonder this guy, you know, I met him as a volunteer. I went to volunteer for him. And I, I right after he died and we found out that it was a suicide, I beat myself up so bad because I thought maybe God sent me there to not allow him to do that. But I held him and not allow, meaning I saw every sign. I heard it in his voice. I knew where he was going because of the way he was thinking, because I had been there. But I had held him in such high esteem as a mentor and a father figure and as a loved one that I could not tell him those things. So um, I beat myself up pretty bad for about six months after he died. But I can tell you that all of the lives that have, that have been changed or affected since I left Amarillo, Texas, um, or in part because of that experience that he gave me and trained me in this business. So I'm eternally grateful for that. Uh, something really great did come out of a very bad situation. And uh, so I'm a living proof and that's why I continue to drink. Uh, if, I, if you can go from where I've come from and all the things that I've experienced and done to myself too, and be here and be a beacon of hope, man, anybody can do it. So that's my story. Oh, dream on dreamer, right? Yes, ma'am. Dream on dreamer. I, it's very rare, Alvin, that I am struck speechless and I do not even know where I want to dig in because that, that was a story that struck, that strikes so many people's hearts. And so many people need to hear that it didn't just, you didn't just wake up one day and you were, well, Alvin Hope Johnson, that hope grew within you. And I believe, as I know you do, God puts us on a path for a certain reason. And God did not want you to end yourself because you have touched <clears throat> so many people's lives. I hope you know that. You have touched so many people's lives. Let's jump into one of the most amazing ways you are touching people's lives today. Actually, two of them. The first being Clubhouse Live. And we were talking about this offline and you keep on saying, you don't know why people are following you, why you have 32,000 followers on Clubhouse while you, you almost have, I know you have over 200,000 on IG. It's because you are Alvin Hope Johnson. You instill hope in others that they might not be able to find on their own. You are that beacon of light for people that might not have hope. So now that I have said that, and I'm not crying, you're crying. How does Clubhouse Live give people hope? Well, uh, wow. It would really be my desire. It's a selfish thing that I'm doing with Clubhouse Live. Initially, I wanted this to be a group where 15 to 20 of us were gonna get together and just set some goals and parameters and meet, right? Mm -hmm. And then that turned into what it did the first time and now where we are today. And as it continues to go, the reason I say it's selfish, first I wanted to meet my friends and now it's selfish because I want to really expose more people to what we have available to us. You know, I hear so many people say that, oh, we hadn't been exposed to 
to this kind of investing, or we didn't know that we could do this type of, of work. And so me and all my dope friends, we do a lot of different things around real estate and business and no better way than to bring it all together and showcase that and just show, again, if I can do this from where I came from with my background, with no college education, my parents were teachers and my grandmother was a principal. Man, they come home from school and tell me to go in the room and shut up because they've been dealing with kids all day. Imagine that. But if I can go from that to what we're doing today, anybody can do any of this stuff. So for people to sit back and say, oh, you got to have this, you got to have that. I don't like those absolutes because you don't have to have anything except a desire and a burning desire to succeed and probably a little faith and a little hope and, you know, a little, little wisdom around uh, who put us here. A little faith, a little hope, a little wisdom. So let's talk a little bit about mentorship because that seems to be a key focus throughout your life. You talked about your mentor who taught you all about multifamily. You, you know, there's our mentor above who is always there watching us and who watched over you. And there's the mentors that we surround ourselves with. So let's talk about the importance of mentorship. What is the importance of mentorship? How it's affected you and how you are now giving back. Good question. I remember, you know, after being well off in my early 20s and then literally uh, having to fight my way back to, to life and then uh, to a position of uh, going from right after that um, suicide attempt, failed suicide attempt. And that sounds so crazy because somebody say that today, you might go, no, it, I almost said a bad word. If you want to kill yourself, <laughs> You'd have done it. Well, I really tried. And so it didn't work. But after that, you know, I drove a truck cross country for a couple of years, hated it, but I got to know myself. Then I, after that, I got a job in a chemical plant for a couple of years, hated it, making six figures back in the early 90s, but hated it and got back into real estate. And uh, after doing that, it's taken me a long time and, and then getting back into real estate uh, as a contractor and then going into the mortgage business, uh, opened a mortgage company in 96 with one guy who knew a little bit about mortgages. And we grew that thing from 1996 to 2000 to where we were doing about $30 million a month in loans with no experience. And then I moved to Dallas and opened another one and did it all by myself and then grew it to 30 loan officers with no nothing, no experience, no mentors. So I was laying in my bed on my 38th birthday and I was alone, not married, uh, several failed relationships, several failed businesses, failed suicide attempts, feeling like the chief loser, right? It was just like, man, you can't do shit right. And I said, well, God, I think, what's this mentor thing? I need a mentor for marriage, for business, and I prayed for, I prayed a long time for that. And um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something I hadn't said in a long time. I remember walking through that house that I bought. So I moved to Dallas after a failed relationship. This was in 2000. Uh, walked off. That was before I started my second mortgage company. I was with this lady and she told me that if I didn't do something, I was going to die. And really, I probably would have. So I moved to Dallas. I had been paying for an apartment downtown Dallas for about eight months, had never been in it. And I said, oh yeah, I do have an apartment in Dallas. Let me go live there. So that's how I was just stupid with money. But I moved here and uh, after my lease was up and my money was gone, I went and bought this big old house in DeSoto, Texas. Didn't have no money, any credit. My credit was shot. Um, and I remember walking through that house one day and I said, man, it sure is quiet in here. And I, I'm not gonna say I heard an audible voice, but I heard it so loud on the inside of me that uh, I heard God tell me, well, you asked for this. And I had to think about that for a minute. And what I had asked him for previously, don't know when, was I wanted to get to know him for myself. You know, my mom drugged me to church as a kid, so I had a relationship with God because of her. I was married and I had a relationship with God because of her. 
I had a girlfriend I had a, and I had a relationship with God because of her. I said, God, I want to get to know you for me. So at that moment, I realized that maybe all of those companies I had and all the money I've been through and all of those things that I had done were none of that was bringing me closer to him. So maybe he had to just let me do without it to get to a place to where he had my full undivided attention. And trust me, he got it. So from there to, um, that's that was when I realized I needed a mentor. And so guess what show, starts to show up? Mentors start to show up. And, and the guy that trained me was that, he was one of those mentors in marriage, business, uh, relationships, partnerships, money, showed me so much of that. And then after him, I've had three or four other guys that have come into my life. Two of my partners that I partner with today are 76 and 67, uh, multi, multi gazillion millionaires. And I never see them, but I talk to them. Well, I hadn't seen them since COVID because they're older and don't want to come to the office. But, you know, for guys like that to continue to come into my life and pour into me and, and help me build this platform that we've done, uh, I would not be here had it not been for mentors. So how important is it? For me, it has made every difference in my life. Uh, I don't consider myself giving back in the form of being a mentor because for me, more was caught than taught. Uh, I, I don't like to consider myself a mentor because I do not want to fail somebody in what their expectations are. And uh, that's very important. It's like, you know, just I'd rather over deliver and under promise, and everybody has different expectations of what a mentor mentee relationship is. And I really have not been able to define those. So I got a few guys that follow me and, you know, we talk as on a mastermind and, you know, that's, if they call me a mentor, then great. I don't call myself that. We just, we just talk it out. And so that's, the, but I don't know if I answered your question, but that's my answer. You did, Alvin. That was a fantastic answer. And for everyone that's listening, and if you do not know Alvin Hope Johnson, he is considered a mentor by many, a teacher by many. And like I said before, a family member to many of many people on Clubhouse call him Uncle Alvin. So maybe, maybe that's what you are. You are an uncle. You are a teacher. And whether or not you label yourself as such, I know that you are also the president of Multifamily Monopoly, and that's an educational platform, newly formed, that you are helping people to understand more about multifamily. Could you uh, explain and expand on that? Yeah, so um, uh, for the last couple of years, people have been telling me I needed to put some courses together. And... So the first thing I did was we did a like a 38 to 40 module course around value add properties and how we bought them and, and the things I've learned uh, about how to put them together and from terminology all the way through site business. So that was one course. And then, um, but in my opinion, that course does not lead to anything because you can buy it, you can take it, you can learn it. But is that going to motivate you or get you enough information to where you can literally go out and change your life? And I didn't think so. So I hadn't promoted that. But uh, a couple of years ago, I decided that we didn't want to buy any more apartments, that we wanted to go develop apartments. So we bought some land and developed that land and turned it into a neighborhood. And now those lots are for sale uh, to a national home builder. And uh, as soon as the weather clears and we get some dry weather here, we'll be pouring concrete on a neighborhood with 363 single family lots in it. And we did that just by saying, let's go do it. So we learned that process and it's taken a couple of years, but also in the process of doing that, we figured out how we can build, you know, several thousand apartments over the next couple of years. And so I got with some of my friends and uh, who are experts in their respective fields uh, for the development and site zoning and entitlement process and the underwriting process, the legal setup of the entities and why we set them up that way, the tax strategists, um, the, the manufacturers of our SIP building process, uh, my contractor. So we all got together and said, hey, let's do this course. Uh, so there's about eight or nine instructors. It's a 12-month 12 12 long course. 
where we're walking everyone through site selection all the way through certificates of occupancy on developments that we're building. And so that mentorship, uh, that training course, we believe will put people in a position to know so much more than just, just reading it in theory, but literally walking through the process of developing a whole complex from the underground utilities to tenants moving in. And so we're gonna do that. We're gonna do that a hundred times over the next five years um, with 200 unit developments. And so we're gonna teach a lot of people this process to do it. And really it's, 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 it's the exposure thing that we talked about, but it's also raising up the next group of investors because everybody's driven down the freeway and went, man, look at that big old building. I sure wish, who's doing that? Well, man, who wouldn't want to be a part of somebody or part of doing something like that? And you can drag your friends by and say, hey, see that big old thing? I'm part of that. I'm part owner in that. And I think that's just going to take so many people to a different level, mindset-wise, mentality-wise, but definitely financially. And uh, so I get to be a part of so many people's financial success just by, um, by offering these types of programs. I'm going to latch on something you just said, this term called, I get to. Oh, yeah. That's what sets you apart, Alvin. You get to be a part of people's lives. You get to put together this amazing, amazing educational platform to teach people how to develop multifamily. You get to. So if people want to be a part of this, of this amazing, amazing community that you're building, how can they find out more about it? Uh, my website is alvinhopejohnson.com. It has everything there about me. Um, it has our courses there. It has all of our information about Clubhouse Live. It has all the pictures there from the first two events or the from the second event, those pictures will be there. You can go find your own picture and download it and, and print it and do whatever you want to do with it. It's going to be really high quality. And everything about me is on that website. It also, there's also a link there that'll lead you to Hope Housing Foundation, which is our nonprofit organization that we do affordable housing with. So everything that we do, even though our new build projects are class A projects, they are for the working family. So uh, workforce housing at its finest is what we're doing. And it's, so I'm super excited about that. So one last question before I let you go. What is one last thing that you can tell my audience if they want to jump into multifamily or if they want to know more about, about your, uh, your Hope Housing Foundation? Well, two ways to answer that. Uh, if they want to know more about uh, anything about multifamily, just call me. I mean, go to our website and um, Hope Housing Foundation's website is hopehousingfoundation.org. You can feel free to check it out. You know, we have great programs for the kids in our communities where we do, um, I think they're doing a school giveaway today uh, with nice. backpacks and school supplies in Dallas to about a thousand kids uh, at one of our communities here. So not only are we providing safe, decent, sanitary housing to the economically challenged and workforce communities across America, but we're supporting those kids and giving school supplies, tutoring after school, uh, we're wanting to get to a place where we can feed them every day during the summer uh, because so many kids don't even eat during the summer because they have free lunch. And uh, so there's there's a big, big gap there. And we're just trying to fill some of these holes in these communities. And um, we've never asked for a donation from Hope Housing Foundation. All the money that we make from our properties goes back into that foundation that supports and builds up those communities, not just the properties, but builds up the tenants the residents, the kids, and the community at large. So, but we are, we, but we can, we're 501c3. So if you guys want to donate, send it to hopehousingfoundation.org, go to that website and all of the money, you can look at our at our 990s and see that our administrative costs of the money we take in is less than 5% of what we use for administrative costs. You do not see nonprofits operating that low. We make our money doing other ways, other things, but everything that comes through that foundation goes back to these communities. So it's super cool. Alvin, I am honored to have you on today. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Peely. Yes. Yay. And
And for everyone that's listening right now, super grateful to you for listening today. You have the best day. And if you love what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe. And please go check out Alvin Hope Johnson at alvinhopejohnson.com. You can get all his information there. Thank you again, Alvin. Thank you, Peely. Tell Jason hi. Aloha. Aloha. I will. Okay. Aloha.